The rattle of anchors woke him. Blinking in the light of the watery sun, he saw the southern fleet on the horizon, riding gracefully in hollow pomp towards the ships of Jagreen Lern. Either, he thought, the southern kings were very brave, or else they did not understand the strength of their enemies. Beneath him, on Jagreen Lern's foredeck, a great catapult rested, and slaves had already filled its cup with a large ball of flaming pitch. Normally, Elric knew, such catapults were an encumbrance, since when they reached that size they were difficult to rewind and gave lighter war engines the advantage. Yet obviously Jagreen Loon's engineers were not fools. Elric noted extra mechanisms on the big catapult and realised they were equipped to rewind rapidly. The wind had dropped and 500 pairs of muscles strove to row Jagreen Loon's galley along. On the deck, in disciplined order, his warriors took their posts beside the great boarding platforms that would drop down on the opponent's ships and grapple them at the same time as they formed a bridge between the vessels. Auric was forced to admit that Jagreen Lern had used foresight. He had not relied wholly on supernatural aid. His ships were the best equipped he had ever seen. The southern fleet, he decided, was doomed. To fight Jagreen Lern was insanity. But the Theocrat had made one mistake. He had, in his gnawing desire for vengeance, ensured that Elric's vitality was restored for a few hours, and this vitality extended to his mind as well as his body. With the sword he was, among men, all but invincible. Without it he was helpless. These were facts. Therefore he must somehow regain the blade. But how? It had returned to the plane of chaos with its brothers, presumably drawn back there by the overwhelming power of the rest. He must contact it. He dare not summon the entire horde of blades with the spell. That would be tempting providence too far. He heard a sudden thwack and roar as the giant catapult discharged its first shot. The flame-shrouded pitch went arcing over the ocean and landed short, boiling the sea around it as it gutted and sank. Swiftly the war engine was rewound, and Elric marvelled at the speed as another ball of flaring pitch was forked into its cup. Jagreen Lern looked at him and laughed. My pleasure will be short. There are not enough of them to put up a long fight. Watch them perish, Elric. Elric said nothing, pretended to be dazed and frightened. The next fireball struck one of the leading ships directly and Elric saw tiny figures scampering about, striving desperately to quench the spreading pitch. But within a minute the whole ship was ablaze, a gouting mass of flame as the figures now jumped overboard, unable to save their vessel. The air around him sounded to the rushing beat of the fireballs and, within range now, the southerners retaliated with their lighter machines, until it seemed the sky was filled with a thousand comets and the heat almost equaled that which Elric had experienced in the torture chamber. Black smoke began to drift as the brass beaks of the ship's rams ground through timbers, impaling ships like skewered fish. The hoarse yells of fighting men began to be heard, and the clash of iron as the first few opposing warriors met. But now he only vaguely heard the sounds, for he was thinking deeply. Then... When at last his mind was ready, he called in a desperate and agonised voice that human ears could not hear above the noise of war. Stormbringer. His straining mind echoed the shout, and he seemed to look beyond the turbulent battle, beyond the ocean, beyond the very earth to a place of shadows and terror. Something moved there. Many things moved there. Stormbringer. He heard a curse from beneath him and saw Jagreen Lern pointing up at him. Gag the white-faced sorcerer. Jagreen Lern's eyes met Elric's and the theocrat sucked in his lips, deliberating a bare moment before adding, and if that doesn't put an end to his babbling, best slay him. The lieutenant began to climb the mast towards Elric. 
Stormbringer, your master, perishes. He struggled in the biting ropes, but could hardly move. All his life he had hated the sword he relied on so much, which he was relying on more and more. But now he called for it as a lover calls for his betrothed. The warrior grasped his foot and shook it. Silence. You heard my master. With insane eyes, Arik looked down at the warrior who shuddered and drew his sword, hanging to the mast with one hand and readying himself to make a stab at Arik's vitals. Stormbringer, Arik sobbed the name. He must live. Without him, chaos would surely rule the world. The man lunged at Alric's body, yet the blade did not reach the albino. Then Alric remembered with sudden humour that Jagreen Lurn had placed a protective spell about him. The Theocrat's own magic had saved his enemy. Stormbringer! Now the warrior gasped and the sword dropped from his fingers. He seemed to grapple with something invisible at his throat, and Alric saw the man's fingers sliced off and blood spurt from the stumps. Then slowly a shape materialised, and with bounding relief the albino saw that it was a sword, his own rune sword impaling the warrior and sucking out his soul. The warrior dropped, but Stormbringer hung in the air, and then turned to slash the ropes restraining Auric's hands, and then nestled firmly with horrid affection in its master's right fist. At once the stolen life stuff of the warrior began to pour through Alric's being, and the pain of his body vanished. Quickly he grasped a piece of the sail's rigging and cut away the rest of his bonds until he was swinging by one hand on the rope. Now, Jagreen Lurn, we'll see who takes vengeance, finally. He grimaced as he swung towards the deck and dropped lightly upon it. The unholy vitality from the sword surging through him to fill him with a godlike ecstasy. He had never known it so strong before. But then he noted that the boarding platforms had been lowered and only a skeleton crew remained on the flagship. Jagreen Lurn must have led his main strength onto the ship, which was now held fast by grapples. Close by was a great barrel of pitch used to form the fireballs. Close to that was a flaring torch used to ignite them. Auric seized the brand and flung it into the pitch. Though Jagreen Lurn may win this battle, his flagship shall go to the bottom with the southern fleet, he said grimly, and dashed for the hold where he had been imprisoned, aware that Moonglum lay helpless there. He wrenched up the hatch cover and stared down at the pitiful figure of his friend. Evidently he had been left to starve to death. A rat chittered away as the light shone into the hold. Arik jumped into the hold and saw with horror that part of Moonglum's right arm had been gnawed already. He heaved the body onto his shoulder, aware that the heart still beat, though faintly, and clambered back up to the deck. How to ensure his friend's safety and still take vengeance on Jagreen Loon was a problem, but Arik moved towards the boarding platform, which he guessed the Theocrat to have crossed. As he did so, three warriors leapt towards him. One of them cried, The albino! The reaver escapes! Auric struck him down with a blow that required only a slight movement of his wrist. The black sword did the rest. The others retreated, remembering how Auric had entered Huamgal. New energy flowed through him. For every corpse he killed, his strength increased. A stolen strength but necessary if he was to survive and win the day for law. He ran, untroubled by his burden, over the boarding platform and onto the deck of the southern ship. Up ahead he saw the standard of Agamilia and a little group of men around it, headed by King Hosel himself, his face gaunt as he stared at the knowledge of his own death. A deserved death for his pride in rejecting Kagan's aid, thought Elric grimly. But nonetheless, when Hotzel died, it would mean another victory for Chaos. Then he heard a shout of a different quality, thought for a moment that he had been observed, but one of Hotzel's men was pointing to the north and mouthing something. Auric looked in that direction and saw the brave sails of the purple towns. They were fighting ships, better equipped for battle than those of the merchant princes. 
their brightly painted sails caught the light. The only rich decoration the austere sea lords allowed themselves was upon their sails. Elric's old friend, Carrigan, must command them. Perhaps there was still a chance for turning the day against Jagreen Lurn, for the Theocrats' fleet would be weary and disorganised. And Elric guessed with him to lead them they might win. With that thought he dropped Moonglum's unconscious body overboard and dived after it into the choppy sea. The blade gave him superhuman strength and he swam towards the leading ship, which he recognised as Cargan's, dragging Moonglum's body after him. Trusting to the Sea Lord's famed seamanship, he swam directly in the path of the leading galleon, shouting Cargan's name. The ship veered slightly and he saw bearded faces on the rail, saw ropes flicker towards him and grasped one, letting them haul him upwards with his burden. As the seamen pulled them both over the rail, Arik saw Cargan staring at him through shocked eyes. The Sea Lord was dressed in the tough brown leather armour of his folk. He had an iron cap on his massive head and a black beard that bristled. Elric, we thought you did. Lost on your voyage south. Divim Slorm is below. It was he who prevailed on me to come to the aid of these effete mainland princes. Now, but I'm too late, I fear. Elric spat salt water. Elric spat salt water from his mouth. Perhaps... But if we do not strike now, Jagreen Loon will have time to reorganise. We must do what we can. Cargan nodded gravely and signed to his seamen. Take the little one below to the physician and tell the Lord Divim Slorm that we have fished out a kinsman of his. As Cargan's orders were obeyed, Elric looked back and noted that hardly a southern vessel remained afloat. For more than a mile the water burned, and the splutter of the flaming sinking ships was blended with the screams of the maimed and drowning. Unless Jagreen learns halted now, Cargan said, it will not be long before the rest of the world falls to his hordes. Divim Slorm came on deck and smiled with relief when he saw Elric. I see you live, cousin, though barely. Do you feel ready to continue the fight? Elric nodded. Stormbringer will supply the strength I need. He was thinking more clearly now, thinking back to something he remembered Jagreen Lern saying about other allies. What kind of allies? Perhaps the boast had been empty. Perhaps not. Well, if they struck now, there might be time to defeat him before those allies could be called. Behind Cargan's flagship, he saw the rest of the fleet, its furthest ships, tiny shapes in the distance. Already the fleet was moving into battle order, forming into five squadrons, each under the command of an experienced sea lord from the Purple Towns. And what of Tsaritsinia? he asked. Divim Slorm smiled. She's safe at least. I sent her on to Karlark with a strong escort. She'll be at her father's court by now. Good, he sighed. There had been so little time spent with her. Not enough. Yet if the Theocrat could be beaten now, perhaps there would be more. Divim Slorm was saying, We have all slept badly these past nights. It was hard won for everyone, and when it came it was troubled. Visions of pits, of monsters and demons, of horrifying shapes, of unearthly powers, they crowded our dreams. Auric nodded, paying little attention to his friend. The elements of chaos in their own beings were evidently waking in response to the approach of the chaos horde itself. He hoped they would be strong enough to withstand the actuality as they had survived their dreams. Disturbance to forward... It was the lookout's cry. Baffled and perturbed, Auric cupped his hands around his mouth and tilted his head back. What sort of disturbance? It's like nothing I've ever seen, my lord. I can't describe it. Auric turned to Cargan. Relay the order through the fleet. Slow the pace to one drumbeat and four. Squadron commanders stand by to receive final battle orders. He strode towards the mast and began to climb up toward the lookout's post. He climbed until he was high above the deck. The lookout swung from his cradle, relinquishing his position to Elric since there was only room for one. Is it an enemy, my lord? he said as Elric clambered into his place. Elric stared hard towards the horizon, 
making out a kind of dazzling blackness that from time to time sent up sprawling gouts of stuff into the air, where it hung for some moments before sinking back into the main mass. Smoky, hard to define, it crept gradually nearer toward Jagreen Lern's fleet. It's an enemy, said Ulrich quietly. He recognised the vast black mass as some manifestation of chaos. Evidently, Jagreen Lern's boast had not been empty. His allies were coming to join him. He remained for some while in the lookout's cradle, studying the chaos stuff as it flung itself about in the distance like some amorphous monster in its death agonies. But these were not death agonies. Chaos was far from dead. The remnants of the Theocrat's fleet had now turned about and were rowing swiftly towards the weird blackness which as yet still had no true definition, though dim shapes could be made out. What was it? Elric felt hopelessness come upon him. They could only fight now, but they were already doomed. From his vantage point, Ulrich also had a clear view of the fleet as it formed itself into its respective squadrons, making up a black wedge nearly a mile across at its longest point and nearly two miles deep. Cargan's ship was a short distance in front of the rest, well in sight of the squadron commanders. Ulrich shouted down to Cargan, whom he saw passing the mast. Stand by to move ahead, Cargan. The Sea Lord nodded without pausing in his stride. The leading squadron was comprised of their heaviest warships, which would smash into the centre of the enemy fleet and seek to break its order, aiming particularly at whichever ship Jagreen Lern now used. If Jagreen Lern could be slain or captured, their victory would be more likely. Now the dark stuff was closer and had met with the Theocrat's fleet. Arik could just make out the sails of the first vessels, spread out one behind the other. Then as they came even closer, he at last recognised the shapes emerging from the general blackness. They were great glinting shapes that dwarfed even the huge battlecraft of Jagreen Lern. The Chaos ships. Auric recognised them now from his own knowledge of occult lore. They were the ships said normally to sail the deeps of the oceans taking on drowned sailors as crews, captained by creatures that had never been human. It was a fleet from the deepest, gloomiest parts of the vast underwater domain which had, since the beginning of time, been disputed territory. Disputed between the water elementals and their king, Strasha, and the lords of chaos who claimed the sea depths as their main territory on earth by right. Legends said that at one time chaos had ruled the sea and law the land. This perhaps explained the fear of the sea that many human beings had to this day, and the pull the sea had for others. But the fact was that, although the elementals had succeeded in winning the shallower portions of the sea, the chaos lords had retained the deeper parts by means of this, their fleet of the dead. The ships themselves were not of earthly manufacture, Neither were the captains originally from Earth, but their crews had once been human, and were now indestructible in any ordinary sense. As they approached, Ulrich was soon in no doubt that they were indeed those ships. The sign of chaos flashed on their sails, eight amber arrows radiating from a central hub, signifying the boast of chaos that it contained all possibilities whereas law was supposed in time to destroy possibility and result in eternal stagnation. The sign of law was a single arrow pointing upwards, symbolising dynamic growth. Ulrich knew that in reality chaos was the harbinger of stagnation, for though it changed constantly, it never progressed. But in his heart he still felt a yearning for this state, for his past loyalties to the lords of chaos had suited him better, to wild destruction than to stable progress. But now, chaos must make war on chaos. Auric must turn against those he had once been loyal to, 
using weapons formed by chaotic forces to defeat those self-same forces in these ironic times. He clambered from the cradle and began to shin down the mast, leaping the last few feet to land on the deck as Divum Slorm came up. Quickly he told his cousin what he had seen. Divum Slorm was astounded. But the fleet of the dead never comes to the surface, save for... His eyes widened. Auric shrugged. That's the legend. The fleet of the dead will rise from the depths when the final struggle comes. When chaos shall be divided against itself. When law shall be weak, and mankind shall choose sides in the battle that will result in a new earth dominated either by total chaos or by almost total law. Is this then to be the final battle? It might be, Alric answered. It is certain to be one of the last when it will be decided for all time whether law or chaos shall rule here. If we're defeated, then chaos will undoubtedly rule. Perhaps. But remember that the struggle need not be decided by battles alone. So separate, said. But if we're defeated this day, we'll have little chance to discover the truth of that. Divum Slorm gripped Mournblade's hilt. Someone must wield these blades, these destiny swords, when the time comes for the deciding duel. Our allies diminish, Alric. Aye, 